Well, we've been on this journey through Advent, and this is our fourth Sunday of that journey. And you know, when we talked about Joseph coming from nearby Bethlehem to Ein Karim to visit Mary while she's staying with Elizabeth, you know, that is probably the time when Joseph learned that Mary was pregnant. As we journeyed with Joseph, we were reminded that sometimes God's most profound work is done when we're in times where we perhaps feel confused, broken, or wounded. You know, when Joseph returned to Bethlehem from Ein Karim, God's messenger came to him in a dream and, and confirmed Mary's story. And after Joseph awoke from that dream, he probably went back to Ein Karim, and he agreed to take Mary as his wife. Soon after that, Joseph most likely announced to his family that he and Mary were moving up the wedding date, and therefore they'd soon be traveling to Nazareth, which was Mary's hometown. Now, we don't know if Mary and Joseph told their families about their visits from God's messengers, we don't know if they talked about what God was calling them to do. But if Mary and Joseph did tell them, how do you think their families responded? Did they believe what Mary and Joseph said? How would you respond if your son or your daughter would come and would tell you that? Joseph and Mary make the nine-day journey back to Nazareth, and they quickly begin making arrangements for their wedding. Now, at this point in time, Mary may have been about five months pregnant when they got married. And for all of those who I know are out there who are already trying to do the math, I got there by a nine-day journey when she went to go see her cousin Elizabeth. She stayed with Elizabeth for three months. And then it was another nine-day journey back to Nazareth. And then she probably spent at least a couple of weeks preparing for the wedding. So that puts her at about five months pregnant at the time they get married. Imagine how Mary's life changed in those five months. During this sermon series, again, our whole focus has been looking in more detail at the story of Mary and Joseph and the story of the birth of Christ. We've been seeking to learn more about Mary and Joseph and their journey in following God's call. So today our journey continues as Mary and Joseph travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. In Mary and Joseph's day, once a couple are married, they typically moved in with the husband's parents. They moved into a room that the, the husband would have added on to his parents' house, and that's where he and, and his new wife would live until the husband had a chance to go buy some land and build a house for his family. So under normal circumstances, Joseph and Mary would have lived in Bethlehem after the formal wedding ceremony. But Mary and Joseph stayed in Nazareth after the wedding instead of going back to Bethlehem to live with his parents. Most likely, they stayed there in Nazareth because Mary was five months pregnant at the time. A journey to Bethlehem in her condition would have probably now taken probably at least 10 days, and it would have been a very strenuous journey on her at that point in time. Plus, if they'd stayed there in Nazareth, Mary's mother would be nearby, and Mary would be able to use a midwife that she knew to help in the birth of her child. But then, suddenly, all those plans changed. In the ninth month of Mary's pregnancy, Roman soldiers came to Nazareth to deliver the emperor's command for a census, which required that every Jewish family would return to their husband's hometown in order to be counted. Since Mary was now Joseph's wife, she was part of his family. So she was also required to go with Joseph to his hometown of Bethlehem. 
And now we know that Mary's initial response to God's call upon her life was to say, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. For as we've been saying in our response, in our opening call to worship, Here I am, Lord. I'm willing to, to follow and to do your will. Even though that was Mary's initial response, her response at this point of her journey was probably filled with a little frustration and a little more emotion. Her response to the news that now the census required a journey to Bethlehem maybe was something like, God, are you kidding me? You, you asked me to bear this child, and I agreed to do that. I took on the shame that came from having a, a speeded-up marriage. I've endured all the whispers and the talk behind my back as I walked through town. And now, I can't even have my baby here with my family and those I know around me. Why, Lord? Why? Why now? What did I do wrong? Why didn't you protect me? Why didn't you change the emperor's commands and his decisions? How can you let this happen, Lord? Maybe you felt that way toward God before. Maybe something has happened in your life that you were so disappointed that all you could do was cry out in anger to the Lord. Or maybe all you could do is cry. Or maybe both. Scripture doesn't tell us how Mary felt. We just know that Mary and Joseph traveled to, to Naz from Nazareth to Bethlehem. They make that journey together. But yet, think about what appears to be just this huge disappointment in Mary's mind. That's one of the most compelling parts of the story about Jesus' birth. I mean, that's the part of the story that we all know, that Mary and Jesus travel to Bethlehem, and then Mary has this child in a stable. Mary can't yet see or understand God's purposes, but God takes the emperor's decision and his actions God didn't cause them, but he takes those and then turns those around and uses those for God's own saving purpose. And you know what? God still does that in our lives today. As we look at more detail about the journey that Mary and Joseph took, there are two possible routes that they could have taken on their way to Bethlehem. Both are shown on the map. The first route is shown by the dotted lines, which is on the right side of the screen. And that would take Mary and Joseph to the east, and then south for 60 miles. Then they would recross the Jordan near Jericho, and then head west to Bethlehem. This is the route that most Jews followed if they wanted to avoid Samaria. You know, many Jews considered Samaritans as uh, really thought they were unclean, they were heretics or a lot worse. So some Jews wouldn't have anything at all to do with the Samaritans, and they would go to great lengths to just completely avoid going into Samaria. And so that's the route that those Jews would choose to take to get to Bethlehem. But this route adds about 20 to 30 miles to the journey. In Mary's conditions, that would probably add another two days. The second route, shown by the solid line that's on the left, that's a more direct path. And this route would take Mary and Joseph due south from Nazareth, through the Jezreel Valley, and along the road that's known as the Way of the Patriarchs. This route was easier during the first half of the journey, but included some hills and mountains in the second half. But this route did include some more well-known watering and rest stops where they could go and, and stop and refresh themselves. Most believe that Mary and Joseph probably took this second route, the more direct route, because 
There's no indication anywhere in Scripture that Mary and Joseph were uh, some who uh, had some ill will against the Samaritans. Nothing like that. They, their life probably helped provide a good example to Jesus as he was growing up of the acceptance of all. But as we think about the two possibilities, two different routes, which are probably determined based upon people's perceptions or feelings about others, I, want, I just invite you to think about your journey through life. Are there places or people that you avoid? Who are your Samaritans? Where is your Samaria? Part of what we've been doing during this series is also including some, some video that helps us truly visualize what this area looked like, what it looked like perhaps a little bit during Mary and Joseph's days, but what it also looks like today. And so I want us to watch just a little bit of a video that Adam Hamilton filmed in the Holy Land. He did this in support of his book that's called The Journey. And a lot of the factual information that I've used throughout this series comes from Adam's book. So let's watch just a brief clip of what this part of the journey would have looked like. So as you can see, that journey wasn't easy, especially if you're nine months pregnant. Now, Scripture doesn't mention the presence of a donkey uh, on their journey, but it seems likely that Joseph would have probably obtained a donkey to help Mary along during this trip. Most images we see of Mary and Joseph's journey portray Mary on a donkey. 
So after these long nine, almost ten days, Mary and Joseph finally reach Bethlehem. Now we don't know if Mary immediately goes into labor or if they're in Bethlehem for several days before Jesus is born. The way the story goes in most Christmas plays is Mary and Joseph arrive in Bethlehem. But because there are so many people there for the census, there's no room for them in the inn, according to our Christmas programs. So the innkeeper offers them space in a stable, and that's where baby Jesus is born. Now, a couple of weeks ago, if you were here with us, we talked about Joseph being from Bethlehem, not Nazareth. And if you're a guest here today, that might have caught your attention a little bit when I kept talking about Joseph going to home to Bethlehem. But there is a lot of uh, resources that support the idea that Joseph was indeed from Bethlehem and not Nazareth. But if you go along with that idea that Joseph did indeed live in Bethlehem before he gets married, then one of the first questions that probably comes to mind is, well, why didn't Mary and Joseph stay with Joseph's parents? Why would they have to be looking for some other place in an inn? Well, the Greek word that's translated in most versions of Luke's gospel as inn is kataluma. And the only other time this word is used in the Gospels is when Jesus sends his disciples ahead of him to find a room where they can use, uh, gather together for their Last Supper. That room wasn't in an inn. We talk about that as being an upper room. That room was a guest room. Now on the screen you'll see the layout of a typical first century home. We know this. We kind of know the, the layout based upon the archaeological remains that are still there today. There was a central room that served as a kitchen and living area. Next to that were the sleeping quarters where the parents slept. Typically, there was also a guest room where children slept. That was the Cataluma. When there were guests, the children slept with their parents or in the main living space. There was also a stable or a small barn. You might think of it kind of like our garages today. It was either behind the house, or if the house was built on or around a cave, then that stable could actually be beneath the house. The stable protected the, the animals from predators and thieves during the night. If Joseph's family had kind of moderate income, which there's no indication uh, really of their status, but we're thinking they were probably within that range. Well, their house would have one guest room. That guest room might hold bed mats for six people sleeping side by side. The main living area could hold additional people if necessary. So the question then becomes, well, how many of Joseph's extended family were in Bethlehem because of the census? Well, we don't know for sure. Scripture doesn't tell us anything about that. But if Joseph had four or five siblings, and each of them had a family, then it's easy to see why there would be no room in the guest room. But even if the house wasn't overcrowded, there's also another argument for why Joseph's family might have set up space in the stable for Mary and Joseph. Leviticus 12, 1 through 7, notes that when a woman gives birth to a son, she becomes ritually unclean until that child is circumcised eight days later. Leviticus 15 notes that anyone who touches a woman who's ritually unclean in this way, well, they also become ritually unclean until that evening. Anything the woman lies on becomes unclean. Anything that touches her becomes unclean. Anyone who touches anything that she lies on are then considered to be ritually unclean. So you can see the difficulties 
that are starting to arise if Mary and Joseph are in the guest room with other family members and it becomes time for her to give birth to her son. So it seems fairly likely that Joseph's parents would have set up some space in the stable for Mary to have her child. It would give Mary and Joseph some privacy and it would keep everything and everyone else from becoming ritually unclean. Now for Mary, regardless of the reasons why she finds herself in Bethlehem, in a stable, as she gives birth, it still had to be such a surprising, such an unexpected way for the long-awaited Messiah, for the Son of God, to come into this world. But even in the midst of the unexpected, the disappointing circumstances, God was still at work redeeming the world. Mary and Joseph would not have chosen this journey. It wasn't the way that they imagined it to be. And we know that it wasn't the last difficult journey that Mary embarked on. A short time after Jesus' birth, Herod would try to kill all of the children around that area in an effort to kill this newborn king. So Mary and Joseph and the child have to flee to Egypt as refugees. Thirty-three years later, Mary would take another journey with her son down the Via della Rosa as she followed Jesus on his way to the cross. We, too, will have some journeys that we may not choose if it was up to us. Life will have its time of disappointments, sorrow, and pain. The good news of the scripture is that God not only walks on these journeys with us, but God also works through these situations to redeem them. God doesn't cause all of the bad things that happen within our lives, but God can turn those around and use those still for God's purpose and God's glory. Because of God's love for us, because of Christ, the other good news is those difficult journeys aren't the end of our story. You know, for us, looking at the the whole story right now, we can see what Mary couldn't see as she entered that stable. You see, Mary couldn't yet hear the angels singing. She couldn't yet see the shepherds running to worship this newborn king. And she didn't yet know that magi and far-off lands were already on their way, bringing guests to worship this new king. And she couldn't know that you and I would be reading and studying her story 2,000 years later as we prepare to celebrate the birth of Christ. The lesson from Mary and Joseph's journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem is about trusting God's purposes even when you can't see them yet. It's about remembering God's gift of love as God sends his son for you and for me. We receive God's gift of love, forgiveness, redemption, and strength as we remain focused on remembering and celebrating the birth of our Messiah, our Savior, Emmanuel, God with us. I do invite you to come to our service of peace and hope tonight. It's at 6 o'clock this evening. And it's a time for us to come and be still before God. And we've been doing an Advent study during the season of Advent called uh, Finding Bethlehem in the Midst of Bedlam. And it goes right along with the focus of our journey during Advent. And so in the midst of chaos, 
busyness, the worries, the disappointment, or maybe even the sadness that may be overwhelming you during this time of the year, I invite you to come and find peace and hope and the love of God that comes through Christ our Lord and Savior. The service tonight is an important part of our Advent journey. It's time for all of us to come and to allow God's loving presence to just pour over us and to fill our hearts with peace and hope. Regardless of what journey you may be on right now, I pray that you will trust God and have faith, peace, and hope in knowing that your difficult journey will never be the end of your story because God is with you. And God will always be right there beside you walking every journey of life with you. Pray you will trust in God's purposes just as Mary and Joseph did even when you can't see it. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we prepare our hearts and open our lives for the preparation of your coming, we are so reminded of that marvelous gift of love that you gave us by sending your son that we first knew as a child, born in a stable and lying in a manger. And Lord, when circumstances and our, our journeys get tough, when we perhaps travel through those dark valleys. Lord, I just pray that we can keep our eyes focused on you, that we will trust in your purposes regardless of what's going on around us. Give us the faith, the trust, the open hearts of Mary and Joseph. And let us truly be willing to say, here I am, Lord. I am willing to do your will. Use me according to that will. Christ's name we pray. Amen.